I want to point out real quick that um, Jesse made a joke about Monkey Island earlier, and then Desmond kind of referenced it. Uh, this is actually my wife. My wife and kids gave me this for Christmas. This is Guybrush, Three Wood, and Stan from Monkey Island. So I don't know why that's a theme this this year. We should make it a theme every year. All right. So I'm talking about controlling MIDI devices in real time with Elixir, and uh, I've got to speed through this. So let's get into it. Okay. So this right here that you're looking at is called the Fairlight CMI Series 2X. Okay. This was built between 1982 to 1985. Uh, when it came out, it was about 30,000 pounds. And um, an article I read about it says, quote, it was used on nearly every album released in the early to mid 1980s. This thing was a workhorse. It was a beast. Um, it, it was an 8-bit sampler, basically. So you feed, in, uh, feed sound in there. It would sample it. You'd play it back. It was 8-bit, so it was kind of a little dirty. But it had a very distinct sound. Um, if you've listened to music in the past 40 years, you've heard sounds that came from this thing on its default uh, sampling library. Uh, there's like orchestra hits that are still being used today. Um, there's all sorts of different cool stuff. Anyway, so one of the things that this thing had was MIDI. And well, what is MIDI? So MIDI is the Musical Instrument Digital Interface. It was uh, proposed in 1981, and it was standardized in 1983. So before this, there were um, digital instruments that would uh, talk to each other, but they typically were limited to single manufacturers. So for example, like a Roland piece of uh, kit would talk to another Roland piece of kit through some um, proprietary technology. And it was very difficult to have different manufacturers' equipment talk to each other. So you can imagine as the 80s kind of entered in, well, as music entered in the 80s, a lot of uh, samplers and uh, synthesizers and drum machines and all sorts of stuff were being used. And it was really hard to record those things and to sync them up to record at the same time. So you had guys, you know, sitting at four different synthesizers counting down to, to one to have to hit the thing so that it will be in sync. And of course, that's super hard to do because we're humans and we're not all perfect. So this proposal was sitting out, well, what if we could come up with this um, standard so that we can have uh, different instruments um, communicate with each other? And since then, it's still in use today, you know, almost 40 years later, it's insane that it's lasted this long. But it was very flexible and um, very powerful, obviously, because it's still in use today. And also, like, the lights and stuff that we're using today probably are connecting through MIDI cables. Um, and uh, there's all sorts of things that can be controlled by MIDI now. But one of the things that we're going to do now is talk about synthesizers. So, um, uh, sorry, sequencer, sequencers. So this is an analog sequencer. This is a, a dope for A155. Um, each of those knobs, uh, there's 16 knobs there on the left, kind of to the middle. Um, each one of those, you kind of dial in a certain control voltage is what it's called. So every time it's on that particular step, it's going to send out through an output a certain voltage. And so um, as you say, okay, go to the next step, it'll send out a different voltage based on where that's, um, that knob is, and so on and so forth, till you get 16 steps, and then that'll output beeps and boops depending on where you plug the thing in. Uh, so that's one type of sequencer. Another type of sequencer is this guy. This is a Roland uh, TR-808. If you've heard uh, hip hop, rap, uh, pop music, all sorts of stuff have used this for decades. Uh, if they don't use the actual uh, piece of hardware anymore, they, they, people try to still find it. Um, there's still many actual old pieces still in use today. Uh, but they're emulated, they're sampled. Um, you've heard sounds come from this piece of hardware. But down at the bottom there, that's the step sequencer that the TR-808 used. You can see that there's 16 steps, just like the analog sequencer had. And what you would do is you would select, a, like say, the kick drum. And you would hit uh, where on the sequence you would want the kick drum to happen. So like you want it on the 1 and the 3. Or the, sorry, the 1 and the 9. So it would be like, doom, 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 doom. So that would be the, the kick sequence. And you go to the, the snare, and you figure out what you want to do there. Um, another type of sequencer, this kind of, this is back to that Fairlight CMI, the, the Series 2X that I showed at the beginning. This thing, again, revolutionized music, not only in the sound, but also how music was made. So this is a software sequencer that the Fairlight had. And even today, if you load up like Logic or uh, like Fruity Loops, Reason, um, Pro Tools, there's all sorts of different sequencers that use something similar to this style. You've got the different tracks. You can see eight different tracks here arranged vertically. And along the horizontal time, it, it, uh, a horizontal uh, plane is time. And you can see that it, there's different uh, hits at different points in time. And you can see all those things at the same time and kind of figure out what you want your drum beat to, to sound like based on this type of sequencer. So I thought, well, I want to create something kind of like this, but I want to do it in Elixir, because Elixir, you know, you can do like, real-time stuff. And 
Uh, I like music and I like binary stuff, and so I was like, well, I'll, you know, I'll give it a shot and see what happens. So that's what we're going to get into. But first, I want to tell you a little bit about the MIDI specification. Uh, so they are 8-bit word messages, okay? Um, they're transmitted serially, and there's 16 channels, which basically means 16 different instruments can listen in on this conversation uh, that MIDI is having and uh, do whatever the, the sequencer tells it to do. So for example, you can daisy chain different instruments together. So you could have 16 different synthesizers listening on different channels. Um, you could have two synthesizers listening on the same channel, for example, if you wanted to like um, uh, layer sounds or anything like that. Um, there is some latency involved because it's a serial interface and there's throughs and all sorts of stuff. So people usually don't daisy chain 16 <laughs> instruments together, but you can do it. That's kind of a cool thing about uh, MIDI. So a MIDI message um, has a status byte and um, less than or equal to two bytes of parameters. Um, so here's some examples. So the first one here is the note on uh, message. So that says, I want sequencer on, uh, sorry, I want the synthesizer on channel one to hit middle C. So that's kind of what this, this, one, uh, this first one is. So a note on in hex is the nine, and then on channel one, that's the first channel, um, which is actually zero. So the first uh, byte you would send is nine zero in hex. The first parameter is which notes or which pitch you want to play, and middle C um, is 60, and in hex that is uh, 3C, so you would send that. And then the velocity is basically saying how hard you want to hit that note. So if you are familiar with the piano, um, which now we are, uh, thankfully, um, is the harder you hit the keys, the, the sound's going to be a little bit different. There's going to be a different timbre based on how hard you hit it, uh, different loudness. Um, sometimes the string will uh, maybe distort a little bit because of how hard you hit it, and you want to mirror that in some sort of uh, synthesizer. So that information is sent as well, and that's um, velocity. And so it's um, the interesting thing about these bytes. Interesting thing about these bytes is they're actually uh, seven-bit bytes, which is kind of weird. Uh, so there's always zero in the front, which means there's only 127 different values that you can send. Uh, so um, there's only you can only hit it 127 different levels of hardness uh, to get that velocity, which is kind of interesting. Um, then you got note off, which again is a similar idea, just a different hex code, um, and then a pitch wheel. Uh, you can kind of bend pitches like on a guitar. You're like, rah, 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 rah. you can do that on the pitch bend, uh, pitch wheel. Um, but on that one, it's got uh, you see the least significant byte and most significant byte. Uh, so you can actually send well 14 bits of information through that. So 16,000 different values. Okay, so now we need to break these down into Elixir structs. And how do I organize all this code? So here's what I, here's how I did. And this is where we get into the part where. This is just how I did it. I don't know if this is the best way. I don't know if this is even it makes sense to anybody else. But I, it works, and I thought, well, that's cool. So let's do it. So I've got a sequence, and a sequence can have one or more tracks, and a track can have one or more patterns, and a pattern can have one or more notes. Um, and so that creates the basically a song, in other words. Um, so a sequence is really um, involved with handling like the overall grouping of a song. So which patterns we're playing and. Um, and all that kind of stuff, and also the, the overall tempo, so they're all playing at the same uh, tempo. Now, a track contains information such as the MIDI channel, so which uh, instrument we want to send it to uh, w based on who's listening, and it's meant to kind of represent a single instrument. You can kind of think of it that way, so like a kick drum or um, a digital piano or a bass or something like that. And then we have patterns. Patterns handle the length of the, uh, the press, so like how long you press that uh, keyboard key, and whether or not, I'm sorry, not the, not the length of the press, the pattern is the, how long the pattern is. Um, and also whether it's active. In other words, if it's playing right now, when the song is playing or the sequence is playing. And it can be thought of as repeating groups of notes. So uh, you could have a pattern in, uh, like a melody pattern in a chorus, for example, or a verse. Uh, that's pattern. So a note, again, there's lots of notes in the pattern. And a note is where in time does that note occur? Uh, also, what note or pitch does it produce? Uh, how hard we hit that note, and also the length of the gate. In other words, how long we hold down that note, that piano key. And we also have, overall, uh, I created a conductor module that basically handles the starting and stopping of a sequence. Uh, there's some recording um, abilities in there as well, so you can play something and it will record uh, the MIDI coming in and uh, store that information for playback later. Um, but we won't quite get into that today. So here's an example sequence um, with all that information. So, we can see here, we've got a sequence, uh, the sequence has a name, and then we can see the list of tracks that it has. And that first track is the kick drum, okay? Uh, and the kick drum is on MIDI channel one, and it has patterns. In this case, it only has one pattern, because um, we're just to say we're gonna repeat this pattern the whole song, you know, early 80s stuff. And 
Um, that pattern um, is active. It has uh, a length of one bar. I didn't show how I defined one bar here, but we'll see it a little bit later. Um, and that pattern has notes. In this case, um, we're doing, let's go back to the kick. We're doing a four on the floor type of pattern here. So, you know, doom, 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 doom. So kind of like uh, in a club or something like that. Uh, so we can see four different kicks happening here in the length of one bar of music. Um, the snare drum hits twice in that uh, same amount of time. And we can see the, the length is the same one bar. And we have two different hits, on the, basically on the one and the three, if you turn, look at the beat. But then the interesting thing is, each one of these patterns can have different lengths. So our hi-hat here has a pattern of PPQN divided by two. And this is where I should tell you what PPQN is. Uh, it basically stands for pulses per quarter note. And that's a way that you can divide up time between quarter notes in a, in a MIDI sequence of um, how many pulses are between quarter notes. Uh, so um, I don't know how to explain it any more than that. In this case, we want the hi-hat to happen twice per quarter note. So basically eighth notes. Um, but you'll see that it only has one note in there um, because I've had it repeating because uh, it's got a smaller length. So in one bar, it's still going to hit like, 16 times, um, but I've only defined one note in there. So that's the interesting about the sequencer is the patterns can be are self-repeating. They know when to loop themselves back. The sequencer doesn't have to know anything about that particular thing other than, hey, we just need to play it, and uh, the, the patterns can figure out what they need to, to put out in terms of uh, note. This is kind of an overall view of it. Uh, so in the conductor, the conductor is a gen, uh, gen server, and so we need to handle pulses, right? So the first thing we do is we look up the current tick. Um, I went back and forth on whether I wanted to call ticks or pulses. I decided on ticks. Um, and I'm basically taking a timestamp from when I press play till now and then asking it which pulse am I on based on uh, the current time um, since I've started the, the sequence. If that current tick doesn't equal the last current tick I had, which Elixir is fast enough that when this loops, uh, a lot of times we'll have the same tick come through, and I don't want to play the same note multiple times. It'd be like you know, 300 bass drums uh, every beat. That'd be kind of odd. Um, and if it is a new tick, then we start um, using that to send out information over a pub sub. Now, in this particular um, code I'm going to show you, I'm not implementing any of the pub sub stuff, but we'll get into that in a little bit. Um, so it's going to uh, broadcast that we're on a new note or a new pulse and if we're on a new actual beat, quarter note. Then we go through our state. Um, we get the sequence. The sequence goes to this thing called events for tick and it passes that current tick. And then it sends those uh, um, pieces of information, those uh, events, out through the MIDI channels. And then, of course, we have, uh, if it's still playing, then loop it back. All right, so let's take a deeper dive into this MIDI sequence events for tick and the current tick. So this is our MIDI sequence module. And you can see that it, you know, it's, it's a structure. Um, it's got uh, tracks, BPM, uh, the name. It's got an ID, a uni unique ID. Those are just defaults, of course. Uh, and then here's our events for tick. So what it does, it takes the sequence, and the sequence has multiple tracks. And so the sequence says, OK, every track, you tell me what, what events for the tick you have. Uh, and that's where we're going to dive in here. So we'll follow the train a little deeper. And so on a track, um, go a little quicker here, um, as you can imagine, it also has an events for tick. And so a track has multiple patterns. And so it asks all the active patterns, say, hey, uh, give me your events for the t this particular tick. And so then we go to the track, or sorry, the pattern. Um, the structure here, I'm going to skip a little bit of this uh, for time's sake. But it has its own events for tick. So it says, give me all the events I have in this pattern and filter them out based on uh, whether or not we're on this particular tick or pulse. Uh, it's going to send that back, and then it's going to flat map it all, um, send it to um, uh, note to event pair right there. And we're going to look at that here in a second. So as I mentioned earlier, a, um, there's a note on event and a note off event. Whereas I'm not storing each of those individually, I'm storing how long someone pressed a key or a piano key, for example. Um, so what I need to do is send a specific note on event and a specific note on ev off event uh, based on how long that, that, uh, the length was of the, of the hold. So I need to have an event pair uh, to do both of those things based on one piece of information. And so here's our MIDI note. Um, it's got you know, the note, the velocity, the tick, exact, this kind of information. And then here's our two event pair. Um, each event is its own struct, uh, and you can see you know, zero uh, sorry, nine zero in hex is the note on, and eight zero in hex is the note off. And I send that information to a library called Port MIDI that I use um, that actually sends the information out over the MIDI channels. So 
I'm going to give a quick demo here real quick. Uh, this is, again, live demos. You, you know how they go. So let's see if this works. What I have, um, the first thing I have is called uh, rack. Let me unmirror my displays here. Uh, mirror. Okay, good. Um, there's a program called VCV Rack, and it basically simulates um, a modular piece of synthesizer. So I've just basically got uh, three different instruments set up here. The first is a kick drum. Um, you can see here it's listening on a uh, virtual MIDI channel that I've created on the MacBook. Um, so it's, I'll reiterate that MIDI doesn't send any information, no sound information, just event information. So it's not, there is no kick drum sound being presented. It's just saying, hey, MIDI channel one, do your thing as a note on event and then note off event. So this is uh, MIDI channel one, uh, MIDI channel two is a snare, and MIDI channel three is the hi-hat. Um, so those are basically just listening on those MIDI channels. So let me start up uh, a sequence, or uh, IX session here. Uh, you can see here, I've, um, whenever I start up an IAX session, I put the output devices that are found. In this case, we want this IAC driver bus one, that's my virtual MIDI device. And we'll go to the, the other MIDI device here in a second. First thing I need to do is tell it that that's the device I want to use. And these output devices are um, stored as gin servers. Uh, so if it goes down, we can restart it back up pretty easily. Uh, so we've got that set. I'm going to load up the example sequence. This is basically just that uh, sequence I showed earlier. And then um, I'm going to ask the conductor to play. And we should hear something come out of VCV rack. There we go. Yeah, so here we, here we can see the different notes coming through, the MIDI uh, events coming through to the kick, the snare, and the hi-hat. And that's looping back and forth over through the sequence as it's playing. All right, so let me stop that. Okay, the next thing I thought, well, the cool thing about making Elixir projects like this is this is the business logic is stored here, but we can have any boundary we want uh, to use this information. So in this case, I just use IEX. But I thought, well, what if we used uh, Live View to use this and make like a, a UI for it? And so let's, uh, let's do that here. So let me do this. And this is where I'm actually using that pub sub. So as soon as we start up this and go to the, um, the web page, uh, it's going to ask us for a device. Um, but this, as soon as I load up this page, it starts subscribing to the pulses and the beats. Uh, so I'm going to set the device as this external device here. And this is where it could get tricky because this thing, I'm going to use this. Now this is, let me plug it in first. Okay, this is a sampler, a uh, super sam simple sampler. I bought it just for this because it was small, battery powered, and uh, it could do MIDI. Um, but you can hear it's got different sounds based on what I'm pressing on here. Okay? So what I'm going to do is um, I've got it hooked up through a MIDI cable here. Uh, through he MIDI cable here, that's basically hooked up through USB through this, which basically transmits the MIDI information. Uh, so this is listening kick, hi-hat, and snare on channels one, two, and three. So I'm going to have Phoenix here uh, start that sequence, and we'll see if it can uh, get this thing to play. There we go. So now that is coming through this, and you kind of see it as it's playing. Um, each of those channels is being triggered through the MIDI here. You can also see that we've got a, a beat indicator going on the top right there so that it knows which beat we're on. And also kind of what we saw like on the, the Roland 808, the step sequencer shows where the kick drum is being hit at that moment. Of course, all this is in Phoenix and uh, live view, so all the, all the events are being sent to the particular um, modules that we wrote earlier. So the start and stop is really just sending events to that gin server. The conductor, um, we can start and stop it obviously over and over and over, and it'll come back through to the live view and update as needed. All right, so that actually worked pretty good. Good. That's really all I have. Um, I wrote a book, Phoenix in Action. Uh, go grab it, phoenixinaction.com. Hopefully, um, you find it useful. Uh, unfortunately, no MIDI in it. Um, maybe in Phoenix in Action version two. Uh, I'm a Geo Lessel. Uh, most places that have um, users, and um, I'm at jeffreylessel.com. So, thank you very much. Yeah.